Today's video will travel through various points in history and examine a collection of mysteries which are obscure, but just as fascinating as any of the more famous ones. From 13th century European explorers who might have discovered North America earlier than we thought Europeans ever did, to a Roman empress who had karma come back and really bite her hard, to the ultimate fate of a mafia boss of bosses from the early 20th century, to a legendary sandstorm and the disappearance of an ancient army which might not even have existed, and of the day it rained meat in Kentucky. This is a collection of obscure historical mysteries. Some of these are very intriguing and thought-provoking mysteries and really just make you wish there was more information to go through. So let's get to them. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if you want to see more like it, and check out more documentaries that I've made. Now let's get right to it and start with the first story we'll be covering. Our first story today takes us way back into time to two brothers, explorers and merchants, who vanished at sea in 1291. Vandino and Ugolino Vivaldi are not widely remembered today, but at the time, they were known for being among the earliest to search out into the Atlantic Ocean, away from Europe. These two sailors were brothers, explorers, merchants, and they attempted a voyage from Europe to India via Africa. This is the voyage that they disappeared on. But first, let's cover a little backstory about them. Italian merchants Vandino and Ugolino Vivaldi were part of the first known expedition in search of an ocean way from Europe to India. The brothers were in command of this voyage. Their little fleet consisted of two galleys, a type of ship that is propelled by mainly oars and manpower. The purpose of the voyage itself was to reach India by the Ocean Sea. Not sure why they called it that, but once they crossed the Ocean Sea and reached India, they were hoping to bring back useful trade to Europe. At the time, it would have seemed like India was a world away. So I can understand that this was a major deal and there was a lot of excitement and intrigue for people back then for this voyage to be successful. So the voyage set off and it went well at first. They reached the southern coast of Morocco with no issues. This voyage was also the first one to set sail out of the Mediterranean and into the vast Atlantic Ocean since the collapse of the Roman Empire around 800 years earlier. So they headed out into the mighty Atlantic. And here is the mystery. They were never seen again. They vanished on this voyage. 22 years later, a Guianese expedition set sail to try to find the brothers, but no traces were found. And the son of one of the brothers also set out to look for his father and uncle in the early 14th century. And they reached as far as the Somali coast on this voyage, but tensions in the region prevented him from being able to go any further in search for them. The explorers are never found, and their ultimate fate remains a mystery to this day. Throughout the later years, even as late as 1455, the mid-15th century, rumors of their fate persisted. There were even sailors who claimed to have met the last descendants of the survivors of the voyage out in far-off lands. But this story should be taken with a grain of salt, as there is absolutely no way to verify it. But the story this supposed last descendant told was that the two ships were lost in the Sea of Genia, and, the, the, and those who escaped, whatever fate befell the ships, were stranded and later held in captivity elsewhere in Africa. At the time, their disappearance was a big deal. Think of it as the Mary Celeste of its day and legends which were passed around told of the brothers sailing all the way around Africa and being held captive by mythical kings in the east, such as Prester John, a legendary ruler whose kingdom was lost amid religious turmoils in the Far East. I want to offer up a little theory of my own before we end this story off. Their goal was to explore the Atlantic Ocean, go around Africa and reach India. So who is to say that maybe they didn't veer away from Africa and out into the west? Now, they were going around Africa specifically to explore the coast and reach India, so probably not, but just, just come with me here for a minute. I have an interesting idea, uh, even if it's just a what-if theory. 
So what if on this voyage, they maybe reached their goal or chose to reassess while sailing down the coast of Africa? Then, what if, maybe, thinking they could find another way to India over the Atlantic Ocean, instead of going around Africa, they headed west? So who's to say that if this happened, maybe they didn't reach America? and then maybe died here or on the return trip to Europe. Most likely this isn't the case, and the most likely answer is they encountered some hazard at sea near Africa and were lost, maybe wrecked on the rocks of some isolated shore, and those who made it to shore later died out in the desert or grassland wilderness. The skeleton coast in Africa is known for all the shipwrecks there, after all. And some areas around there are also known for treacherous waters, bad weather, and rogue waves. But it is an intriguing theory to think about. What if they felt the open ocean, a straight shot to India over it, was better than a treacherous trip around Africa? No one knew a continent was in the way, so what if they thought it would be a longer trip, but going straight over the Atlantic to India would be safer? Longer voyage, yes, but maybe a less hazardous one. Because, you see, even back then, they knew how big the Earth was, so they would have known it would have been a longer trip, but again, maybe they thought it would be a safer one. Just think about it. Open ocean with no threats ahead, or a super dangerous ocean around the coast of Africa where it's known to be violent? It just makes you wonder, what if? At the very least, it could make for a very cool speculative film or book. But either way, on that voyage... The two brothers vanished with their ships and their crews, and they have never been seen again in over 700 years. Now I get it. These two lived getting close to 800 years ago, and to us, they're just distant names in history. They might as well have lived on a completely different world than we do now considering how people lived in the 13th century versus how we do in the 21st. But these two were people. Once as alive as you and me, it's just as important to keep that in mind. Sometimes you can forget that when they lived so long ago, when they're just names from centuries ago. Long ago days we'll never know. But they lived on the same planet as we do, and their story should be told. It's... It's up to us to remember what came before, no matter how long ago it was. This next story is about a Roman empress who schemed behind the backs of many before it ultimately came back to bite her. That part of the story is clear, no mystery there. What is unclear is how exactly she died. Different accounts offer different versions of the events. So let's go through the story, review the accounts of her death, and try to piece together what really happened. We're going even further back in time for this one than the first, back to when the Roman Empire was still around. This mystery takes us to 59 AD. Now on to the backstory. Julia Agrippina, better known as Agrippina the Younger, was born in November 15 AD. She was the daughter of Agrippina the Elder and the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero, the fifth Roman emperor. She reportedly had a double canine in her mouth, her upper jaw specifically, which was seen as a sign of good fortune. She was indeed one of the most prominent women of her time. She played a prominent role behind the scenes in the affairs of the Roman state, including moving her son Nero into succession for the role of emperor. Claudius learned of her plotting, but died in 54 AD before he could act on that information. Rumors suggested that Agrippina had poisoned him. But that is not the unsolved death we're talking about in this section. We're talking about Julia's unsolved death in 59 AD. Let's get to it. We don't really know what caused her death. There was a lot leading up to it, her relationship with her son being tense, I could say. Unhealthy, toxic, stalkerish, many of those work. It was tense on both sides, 
he actually sent servants specifically to annoy her. Regularly, too, if that tells you anything. And again, this whole backstory could make an entire video, honestly. But all surviving accounts of her death contradict each other in at least minor ways. None are completely consistent on the whole. So, yeah, we have totally reliable information here. Most of these are regarded as fantastical rather than historical as well. But there are constant events and story elements in each one. So maybe we can piece together the real story by comparing and contrasting all three and figuring out what remains consistent. So let's have a look at them. There are three accounts that we are going to go through. Maybe more existed back then, but they've become lost if they did. These are the ones which still exist today. I'll pop the name of each one on screen and then summarize that one. Then at the end, we'll compare notes. That's right. Get your notebooks out and start taking notes, class. Our lecture is in session today. To summarize the first account, it begins in 58 AD. Nero had become involved with a noblewoman who taunted him for being a mommy's boy. Wanting to divorce his current wife and marry this noblewoman, Nero decided to kill his mother. Alright, well, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. His motive? Because such a move as that divorce would not have been politically feasible if his mother was still alive. Despite that, Nero did not actually marry this noblewoman, Poppea Sabina, until 62 AD. Years after Julia's death, according to this account, Nero considered having his mother stabbed or poisoned, but he felt these were two suspicious methods of killing her. So instead, he built a boat, which was designed to sink. Okay, fair. No one could dive to shipwrecks back then to look for sabotage. This attempt, for all its complexity, supposedly failed, though, and Agrippina swam to shore, though she was nearly crushed by the ceiling of the boat when it collapsed. This account says that it was designed to collapse on itself and then sink, but the ceiling was stopped by a sofa, sparing her but crushing her attendant. Nero, once he learned she survived the sinking, then sent three assassins to kill her. And that's where the summary of this account that I read ended. A dramatic sinking ship story, but she was still alive. So let's see if the next one at least doesn't end on a cliffhanger, because I bet we're never getting a follow-up to this nearly 2,000-year-old text. This second account says that Agrippina's overbearing nature and her constant over-watchful and over-critical eye she kept on Nero is what led him to snap and to attempt murdering her. This account says that he did try poison, Three times, in fact, but Agrippina saved her life by taking an antidote. In advance. Each time. Curious that she knew that he was trying to poison her and was just okay with that happening. This account also says that Nero's ultimate plan was to lend her a boat which was designed to collapse on itself and sink. He'd apparently gone all, here's Johnny, all over the other boat that she was supposed to take and damaged it so she would have to take the one he so graciously offered. So that's two accounts so far, which have poison and then a self-sinking boat. Perhaps some of these aspects came from the same source and represent some clues to what really happened? I feel like the constants of these stories are things to keep note of. So be sure to write them down, class. Let's keep going and find out what else is consistent. She reportedly survived in this account too, and Nero panicked. Fair enough. And he ordered her assassination, making it look as if she had committed suicide. In this account, it is reported that Nero believed Agrippina haunted him for the rest of his life following her death. On to the third and final account of Agrippina's death. Let's see if this one follows some of the same beats as the first two, or if it goes on its own merry way instead. Like the first, Poppea was mentioned as the catalyst for the murder of Agrippina. One thing that is also the same is that a ship is again mentioned as being the cause of death. 
So it seems likely that unless all of these came from some false source, that this likely did happen. In this account, the ship was reported to be designed so that it would open up from the bottom while out at sea. Agrippina boarded the vessel, and after the bottom opened up like a hungry sarlacc, she fell into the sea. In this account, Agrippina also made it back to shore, so it seems like the ship assassinating plot failed in real life too. And another constant thing is that Nero then sent assassins to kill his mother. You know, I feel like that would have been easier. Like... You want to make it just look like a suicide or an, or an accident, but building an entire boat, that's a big effort. He was really committed to that. I feel like you'd be way more likely to get busted building a murder boat than you are just paying some guy to do the stabby stab. Well, like I said, it sounds like a movie plot. But anyway, Nero also claimed that she killed herself. And this account adds that as the assassins moved in to kill her, Agrippina's final words were, Smite my womb. Classy but not unwarranted since she was basically throwing a final insult to her son because she wanted the part of her body that gave birth to him to be destroyed first. Nero viewed his mother's corpse following her death, commenting that she was beautiful before he had her cremated. In the following years, he had nightmares of her haunting him and it got so bad that he had to beg the ghost for forgiveness. Nero wasn't the only one with the body count in this story. His mother had 12 known ones. So the mystery of this story is this. Which account of her death is true? Or if none are accurate, then which ones have accurate aspects to them? Which parts are accurate? Due to these aspects being the same in all three, I'd say the ship trap and the assassin sent after this failed are true. And since it appeared in two of the three... Papaya being the catalyst, and Nero attempting to poison his mother are also likely to have occurred, but ultimately, we'll never know which of these accounts are true, if any, or what really happened. But it seems that these accounts got all their information from one source. Is that source accurate, though, is the question. With this mystery, we can just use the clues we have and piece an account together. So... Pick your poison, no pun intended, and decide for yourself what might have happened. Tell me which of these three accounts you think could be the true one, or closest to the true events. I'd love to know which one you think is the answer to this ancient mystery. And with that covered, let's move on to the next one. This is going to be one of the really short ones we cover today, this is one of those stories where there just isn't much information about it available. For a lot of these stories, we just don't know, and this is one of those, and it's also one that I wish there was more information about. The life and fate of Sebastiano di Gaetano has all the elements of a movie plot. Sebastiano was an Italian-born mafia boss who lived in New York City. He briefly even became the boss of the bosses of the Sicilian-American Mafia, after the previous boss of bosses had been convicted of counterfeiting money in 1910. The boss of bosses is essentially the top boss. He can order around the other bosses in other groups, from what I understand, and not just his own. Shortly after stepping down from this position in 1912, he disappeared. This is the story of Sebastiano di Gaetino and the mystery of his ultimate fate. Sebastiano was born in Sicily in 1862. He later left Sicily and arrived in the United States in late October of 1898. He arrived alone, but his wife and child joined him by 1901. By 1908, the family had moved to the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, where Sebastiano became a barber. By either 1909 or 1910, Sebastiano is believed to have become the boss of the Williamsburg-centered Mafia, a mafia run by one of the five families who dominate organized crime in New York. He stepped down by 1912, but before doing so, he had some trouble with Salvatore Clemente, a Secret Service informer who was also a counterfeiter. 
Sebastiano had told him to refrain from his counterfeiting activities until another individual had been disposed of for suspected disloyalty. Because Sebastiano had been made the boss of bosses, he was allowed to place orders on members of different mafia crime families. He was the top boss of all the bosses. After Diagatano stepped down in March 1912, Salvatore claimed that it was because he had lost his nerve. Now, here is the mystery of this whole story. After stepping down, Diagatano disappeared from history. No one knows his true fate. No one knows where he went or what happened to him. He just vanished from all historical records. But some historians have suggested that he might have returned to Italy with his family. I wish there was more on this one. I find the unsolved nature of this intriguing, since he was a noteworthy person and he just vanished completely. That's unusual. But again, there's just not many details. Whatever his ultimate fate was, we'll probably never know. It'll be a mystery that forever remains unsolved, like it has for over a century now. So that last case was a very short one, but thankfully this one has a lot more information about it. We're going way back for this one, even further back than the 1200s or even ancient Rome. This one takes us back to 524 BC because we are talking about the lost army of Cambyses. According to legend, this was a Persian army of 50,000 men sent across the western desert of Egypt by Cambyses II. Also, according to legend, the army was halfway across the desert to its destination, a city in Egypt that it was going to sack, when a sandstorm appeared which swallowed them up, and they were never seen again. Now, the mystery of this case is this. Did this army even exist? It's like the Orang Madan of ancient Persia. Did it exist? And if it did, what happened to it? Or... Is it just legend? They were supposedly buried by the powerful sandstorm somewhere out in the desert, but no traces of them have ever been found. Many Egyptologists consider the story to be an apocryphal one, meaning a story which the validity of is doubtful, but is also believed by many and is often circulated as being true. Many have searched for the lost army, and still do to this day, but for this video we're going to be focusing on the big investigations that occurred in the 1980s, and then again in the 2000s. So let's get into these a little bit and see what they found, and if they unearthed anything to clue us in as to if this army truly existed. The first expeditions in the 1980s is what we'll start with. The first expedition occurred in 1983 and into 1984. It was led by American journalist Gary Chaffetz and sponsored by Harvard University. The search for the lost army, or any traces of it, lasted for six months and took place along a remote 62-mile-long region of the Egyptian-Libyan border in an area of complex sand dunes. This sounds like the perfect place for an ancient army to have been buried. Participating in the expedition were 20 Egyptian geologists, a National Geographic photographer, two Harvard film students, and some of their supplies included three camels, a lightweight aircraft, and ground-penetrating radar to search for any traces of the buried army. They discovered 500 ancient grave sites, but no traces of the lost army. Some bone fragments which were found were dated to around 1500 B.C., which is a thousand years earlier than the date the army supposedly disappeared. They also found a small sphinx carved into the rock of a cave, which that's pretty cool. It was a Persian sphinx. So, while they didn't find what they were looking for, the expedition was not a total failure. I'd be happy with finding that. So the expedition did not find any traces of the lost army, and I'll wrap that story up there. I'm not going to get into the whole political fallout, which happened right after it. Let's just say the Egyptians got an airplane out of it. You want to see how? You can look that up for yourselves. That'll be getting too off topic. 
The next expedition to find the Lost Army was in the summer of 2000. That year, a geological team from an Egyptian university were prospecting for petroleum in Egypt's western desert, and they came across well-preserved ancient fragments. These included bits of metal that resembled weapons and human remains, and it was believed that traces of the Lost Army had finally been found after 2,500 years. The Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities announced that an expedition to explore the site would be launched and it would investigate it for more, and no other information was released. Another possible hit came in 2009, when two Italian archaeologists... Two Italians? Huh. Our Italian merchants from the 13th century must have gotten new careers after disappearing near Africa. Well, nice to know they didn't let themselves be kept down by one failure. Okay, that was, a, that was a joke, but it's kind of funny because these two archaeologists are also brothers. These archaeologists announced that they had found human remains, tools, and weapons which dated to the era of the Persian army. These remains and artifacts were located near an oasis in the desert as well. And at first, this might sound like a super promising and exciting development, but these two have had doubts cast upon their claims. They presented their finds in a documentary, rather than a scientific journal, and the two brothers were also filmmakers, known to have created shock documentaries in the 1970s, so their filmography doesn't inspire confidence. And I'm not going to mention some of the things that people witnessed in their previous films. Uh, trust me, you don't want to know. Let's just say that people didn't buy what they were selling. Now, a mindset I generally have, and have voiced in my Loch Ness Monster documentary, is that legends like this usually come from a source, a true source. So maybe a forgotten army really did vanish out in the desert, or was defeated out in the desert, as a 2015 report suggested. And traces of it are just waiting to be found. Who knows? But you never know. So tell me what you think. Does this story come from a possible true source? And if so, was the army defeated in battle or truly buried in some Goliath sandstorm? I think that the army probably existed in some form, and finding any remains of such an army, probably not as big as the legends say it was, would be hard if it was swallowed by the desert, be it in a sandstorm or just being buried after losing a battle. But again, tell me what you think about this one, and we'll move on to the next one. Jumping ahead around 2,000 years after the disappearance of the Lost Army for this next one, we have the story of the first murder in London with a firearm. A murder which has never been solved, and the perpetrator has never been identified. Once again, this is going to be one of the shorter ones, but if you're into true crime, you'll probably like this one. Our victim in this story is Robert Packington, the grandfather of Queen Elizabeth I's favorite, Sir John Packington. He was born in 1489 and is remembered today for being the first person to be murdered with a handgun in London in 1536. So let's get to the murder. On the morning of November 13th, 1536, while crossing the street, Packington was shot and killed. Now, guns weren't exactly common back then. The general person probably couldn't afford one or have access to one. So whoever the murderer was, was likely someone who had connections, or was someone from nobility, or maybe just a random person hired by someone of a higher class and given a gun to do the deed. Whoever this was, they went and got a firearm, meaning that they were probably someone with money, so I don't think this was just a random mugger from an alley. It was targeted. Maybe personal or political, but it was targeted by someone from the higher class, or even maybe from the royal court or the church itself. Here's a quote from the time. And one morning amongst all other, being a great misty morning such hath seldom been seen, even as he was crossing the street from his house to the church, he was suddenly murdered with a gun, which of the neighbors was plainly heard, 
and by a great number of laborers there standing at Sopper's Lane Inn. But the deed doer was never espied nor known. A great reward was promised for information that led to the capture of the killer, but Jeff the Killer was never found. There was also some fallout because of the murder by this mad gunman of 1536, because it was seen as martyrdom by Protestant reformers, and religious controversy spiked because of this. And reformers began suggesting that a, quote, conservative bishop was behind the killing. Others claimed the clergy was responsible. A rumor was started by John Fox in 1559 that a former bishop had paid a priest 60 gold coins to carry out the murder. Some of these aren't unfounded. Packington was known to be sympathetic to the reformers. But again, there is no direct evidence that this was the catalyst for the murder. And at the time, religion was a huge thing and religious persecution was not uncommon. Rumors and accusations continued for years, but they get very political, so I'm just going to skate right on by those. I don't do politics, even from 500 years ago, because someone would probably find a way to connect it to current things going on. But at the end of the day, though... All these claims are just that. Claims. The true identity of the killer, the mad gunman of 1536, has never been determined, and honestly, probably never will be at this point. Records show Packington's children were orphaned by the murder and placed into the care of the city. Packington's son was eventually placed into the custody of his grandfather, Sir John Baldwin. Pa Packington himself was buried in St. Pancras Church. And records tell us a monument was placed there in his memory, but it is no longer there today. So with that, let's move on to another story, our final of the day, and something a little closer to the modern day. Here's one more short incident I'm including before we wrap up. So let's set the scene. Close your eyes, and imagine you're just living on your rural farm in late 19th century Kentucky. Maybe you're inside washing the dishes, or outside hanging the wash, or tending your field, or chopping firewood. And all of a sudden, without warning, chunks of meat reported to be as big as 4 by 4 inches across began raining from the sky, plodding on your roof, in your yard, probably on you if you don't get inside. The meat shower continues for several minutes before stopping as suddenly as it began. The sky was clear the whole time, and a decent-sized area of several hundred yards has been covered by the stuff. Well, as odd as it sounds, that's what happened, and people just kind of seem to not care. Like, oh, meat rained from the sky today. Oh, well, better go check the crops. Maybe I'll even eat some of it. Like... I think I'd be a little invested in finding out what happened and not just shrugging it off. On March 3rd, 1876, over a period of several minutes between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., what appeared to be chunks of maybe red meat rained from the sky over a 100 by 50 yard area in Bath County, Kentucky. People didn't know what it was. Some reported it looking, quote, gristly. The type of meat was also never determined, but there were a range of theories from it being beef, lamb, deer, bear, horse, or even human. With that last one in mind, it's a bit concerning that reportedly people ate some of it. One individual named Miss Crouch witnessed the incident and brought her story to the local newspaper. She was 40 feet from her front step, making soap, and said the following. The sky was perfectly clear at the time, and she said it felt like large snowflakes. And one piece fell near her, which was three or four inches square. She added that two men tasted the meat, why, and said that they thought it was mutton or venison. The family cat also apparently found it tasty. More types of meat that were suggested after some more testing included it being lung tissue from either a horse or a human infant, which is concerning, and it was also suggested that it might have not been meat at all, but cyanobacteria blobs. Miss Crouch and her husband believed the shower was a sign from God. 
Another theory involved murder. Okay, so you're going to have to listen to this. You kind of got to come with me on this one. It was put forth by some that the meat was actually what was left of two brothers who had gotten into a knife fight, and then a tornado came by Wizard of Oz style and sucked the carnage up and dropped it. Yeah, a tornado on a clear, calm day. That makes sense. I could not find the names of these supposed brothers as well, so I'd say take that one with a huge grain of salt that you're going to sprinkle all over the meat before you make yourself a tasty dinner. Another incident was also reported in Europe as well later on, which was apparently very similar. So apparently this is just a thing that happens. Now, what has to be the most popular theory to explain this incident is a theory that was put forth by an unnamed farmer, and scientists have voiced their support from even way back then, that the meat was the result of vultures vomiting up a recent meal. Turkey vultures are known to gorge themselves to the point they can barely fly, and in such a case they can lighten the load by regurgitating their last meal. If that's true, then people literally ate half-digested vulture vomit. And I gotta be honest here, with that big of an area, with that much meat, raining for that much time, and the sky reported being clear, the vulture theory just doesn't do it for me. I feel like people would have seen the vultures because of just how many that would have taken for that much meat to fall over that big of an area for that much time. Like, that would have been hard to miss. I'm not saying it was, like, supernatural, but I don't think the vulture theory does it. So I'll let you make up your own mind on this one. Oh, and also some historians are wanting to recreate the meat shower, so if you live in Kentucky, look up before you go outside. So which mystery did you find the most interesting? Which would you like to see solved the most? And did you know of any of these? Tell me in a comment. I'd love to know. This was a new idea I had, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. You lovely viewers seem to enjoy the missing ship videos a lot, so I hope you enjoyed this new type of unsolved mystery video. And for me, I kind of want to know what the meat shower was. Again, the vulture theory just doesn't do it for me. You'd need so many to get that outcome. I feel like people would have noticed the birds swarming in the sky and wouldn't have said it was clear. I think I also want to know what happened with that one because that wasn't really that long ago. There's still people alive today who knew people who were alive in 1876. As crazy as that is just to say, it goes to show it really wasn't that long ago. Plus, it also occurred not very far from where I live, so yeah, I want to know what happened there. Also, to the people wanting to recreate it, invite me. Please, I want to see this. Please, I will be your documentary guy for it. Just hit me up in a comment. I want to see this. All right, then. So thank you for watching. And again, I hope you enjoyed and tell me the things I asked in a comment. And before we wrap up, I'll tease you with the next documentary topic. We're going even further back in time than any of these stories took place way, way back and talking about the Hadean Eon of the Earth. When talking about the history of our planet, you can't go any further back than that. This is way further back than even the Boring Billion was. I also have topics picked out for a volume 2 of this video, more obscure and some really weird ones. So if you liked this and you want to see more obscure mysteries, let me know by liking and subscribing, and I will definitely start working on the actual script for it. And if there's interest, you can expect it maybe very shortly after the Hadean video. I think this could make a really fun new series for the channel. So until then, again, thank you for watching. Check out my other documentaries. I'll put the thumbnails of a few favorites on screen at the end here for a few seconds, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one, everyone.